Shop of Tears. These are the six things I wish I knew before going into the culinary field. And I am definitely not here to gatekeep. I want to let you know the realities of what it's like. So if you have any questions, be sure to put them in the comments and I will either answer right there or it might even be so in depth, I need to make another video for it. So if you are somebody interested in going into the culinary field, I feel like these are six things that you should really think through um, and I don't want to discourage anybody from it, but I think that being realistic about what you're going to experience and maybe even working, like starting to work now at strategies or healthy coping skills through some of these things can uh, really make your career a, a success while also, you know, like taking care of you, your emotional and physical needs. <laughs> So today I am going to go over six things that I wish I knew before I started working in the culinary field. And some of these things I, I knew like, as in like bullet points of information, but it's different knowing in that way versus like having the experience and really knowing what it means. So knowing of something is different than knowing something real well. And you know you don't really know what you don't know until you learn what you didn't know. <laughs> so I know it's it is difficult to really um, have a familiarity and, and know things before you're actually experiencing them. But I encourage you to think through these things. Oh, and I guess I should introduce myself. So I'm Chef Nakia. I own a grocery delivery and virtual chef, personal chef service in Colorado. I graduated from Johnson & Wales back in 2014 and I've worked in restaurants, hotel, resorts, um, museums, food department, and research and development at a dessert manufacturer. So I started my first restaurant job when I was 17 years old and I left for culinary school when I was 18 years old. So I was very young, young and naive. Yeah, and um, and I didn't really have like work experience outside of this um, to compare a restaurant work working job with. So now, over a decade later, if I could go back in time and tell myself and really stress to myself the importance of some of these things, I would. So the first thing I wish I knew is just how uncomfortable kitchens are. Um, it, it, it really is like a challenge to your senses. And it's definitely something that you hear, you know, like can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen and, and whatnot. But you, it's, it is hard to understand the number of hours you'll spend in a kitchen in various uh, environments, I guess we'll say, um, until you're actually in it. So like temperature wise even, a lot of times it's really, really hot or if it's not really hot, you are probably in pretty cold conditions. Um, there's rarely like a comfortable in between. So it might be cold when you get in at like 4 a.m. in the morning and you haven't turned the ovens on yet. Or if you're working with chocolate, you want a cooler room because that's best for chocolate. Or even if you're doing like garmage, so like a lot of prep for salads and, and stuff like that. Um, you're going to be in a cold room. And then if you're cooking on a line, it's going to be real hot. If there's, you know, a, a flat top, fryers, if you're like a saucier working over a stove, it gets hot. <laughs> so there's very rarely a nice even medium. And then as far as like sound, like it, it is pretty loud. You have a lot of people talking and you have all of the equipment running. It's just a loud environment. Usually there's at least one person who's in charge of the speaker and in charge of the music. And the music's probably gonna be pretty loud and you might hate the type of music that they love, but guess what? They're in charge of the speaker, so you just kinda have to deal with it. <laughs> so on top of that, like potentially harsh music or sounds, um, there's pretty harsh fluorescent lighting too. And all in all, it's not that big of a deal. But if you think about like a nice calming like spa type working environment, this is like the 
absolute extreme opposite. <laughs> and of course there are going to be strong aromas. So if there are certain ingredients or certain smells that almost make your stomach turn, that almost make your stomach turn, um, you're going to have to find a way through that uh, because you got to cook what you got to cook and that's going to include some aromas that you may or may not like. And then it is a pretty crowded space most of the time. So you gotta get used to you know, working with your elbows in as much as you can, taking up as little space, being as efficient with your space as you can, and be okay getting real close to your coworkers. Which leads perfectly into, you will see a, every single facet of your coworkers' personalities and emotions, good and bad you're all working in there together, it, it can feel like a pressure cooker. Um, there is the stress of tight timelines and it's a team effort. And if one person on that team isn't pulling their weight, then that's gonna cause frustration. And even one person's frustration is going to be felt by every single other person in that kitchen. Um, if you are thinking about you know, the, the energy and the vibes that you work well in, your, the energy in that kitchen is dependent on every single person there, not just you. So you could come into work in a great mood and you hope everyone else is in a great mood today too. Because then it's super fun. It's one of the most fun working atmospheres. Um, but one person's sour attitude can really <laughs> bring it down and you can't really you know, physically go to another room or anything to try to get away while you're there. Another aspect of being there with your coworkers is understanding that it's getting better, but unfortunately there is still a lot of sexism and misogyny in the food service industry that gets a pass. Uh, you may or may not work for people who see inappropriate jokes or inappropriate comments as being business problems, it might just be like, well, you have to deal with that on your own. And I hope that wherever you go to work is not like that and everybody is super respectful and kind, but have that on your radar that it is possible. And that's on all I'm gonna say about that for now because this could turn into like a 45 minute video just about that and I'm gonna go on to number three. <laughs> number three is pretty silly, especially coming from me. Um, it's just, you know, super problematic that there's a lack of fashion overall <laughs> and this is definitely not something that I think is um, any reason to not go into the industry but it's just something I didn't really think about um, until I was in it so for health reasons like um, food safety health reasons you can't have any fingernail polish on because bacteria can hide in between your fingernail and the polish. Also, that polish could chip off into somebody's food and that is disgusting. So you always want short nails so that you can actually work with the food well. No painted fingernails. Minimal makeup. I mean, part of that is just like you're probably gonna sweat it off anyway, but there's also bacteria in makeup and like especially mascara. Um, I, for, I forget the exact number, but one time, it was when I was in school, someone shared with me the like average amount of bacteria on an eyelash with, ma with mascara. So if your eyelash like falls into the food, that is super duper gross. Um, so yeah, definitely want like minimal makeup. Some places this is more of a rule where it's like, uh-uh, none at all. Other places it's more of just like you make that decision for yourself. Um, but work, you know, a 12 hour shift in full face makeup and then tell me if you ever want to do that again. <laughs> Another, uh, you know, grooming and like food safety thing is definitely hair. So you cannot have your hair just out and about. It's gotta be contained in some way, whether that is a hat or a hairnet in tight braids. Uh, some people, you know, of course will get pixie cuts. Others, if they do have choose to keep longer hair. It's braided in a ponytail and a bun every day. Um, and that does also like create more stress on your head and create more tension headaches. That's kind of a side note. And then of course, no jewelry because kind of like with makeup potentially falling into food, like if you have a necklace on, it could potentially fall into food and that would be dangerous. 
Um, places will allow you to have like a plain wedding band, but even then that can get in the way sometimes and you always want to make sure you're washing your hands really, really well around that ring, even if it is, you know, a plain band where there aren't, aren't nooks and crannies where bacteria can hide, um, it's still a risk there. Minimal jewelry, meaning like basically just a wedding band, like no earrings, no necklaces, no bracelets would get in the way. Mm -mm. And then your uniform, what you're wearing, it's basically the same thing every day. It's whatever t-shirt you don't mind getting super sweaty, <laughs> chef coat and chef pants, or I will say for a lot of my jobs, I've worn like black dress pants um, because that was easier than chef pants for me. But the point is, oh, and, and comfortable shoes that will save your feet. The point is some jobs, in the morning, you might get dressed up in how you want to present yourself to your coworkers and you might use your wardrobe as, as a way to do that. And in the kitchen, pretty much everyone is wearing the same thing. So as you are you know, prioritizing work and everything, you are not gonna be keeping up with fashion trends, with you know, what are the new makeup products, unless you have like a very active social life outside of work and you don't work too many hours to where you can't have a social life. <laughs> you just, it, you won't have like that daily um, purpose of needing to look at it, what's going on in the fashion industry. So like I said, it's a little bit silly of like, oh no, you might not be the most on trend. Uh, but for some people that is important and even if it's not, um, just don't expect yourself to stay in the know. One thing that I did not know, and like I really did not expect, is everybody, it feels like everybody will ask you for nutrition advice. As soon as they hear that you work with food, they'll just come at you with all kinds of questions. And you know, people will start to ask you like, what should I eat? And in my case, I'm always like, well, what do you like to eat? You know? um, in my specific degree that I got, it wasn't a nutrition degree. So we did have one nutrition class. So I have some understanding around nutrition, but I'm not a dietitian. I'm not a nutritionist. And, but it, it is kind of funny to hear, um, to see what people's expectations still are from you once they hear that you work with food. Um, another common thing that happens is people will come up and say like, I just heard, and then like insert whatever crazy health advice or nutrition thing, like eggs will kill you or blueberries are the best thing ever made, whatever. And then they'll be like, is it true? Is it true? As if you're like the number one authority. <laughs> and so um, be prepared for that. I think that's when you can kind of get your responses ready in whatever way you feel the most comfortable to respond to those types of questions from people. And then the last aspect of this is, I think very weird, but I've seen it. People will judge your food based off of how your body looks. Um, I don't want to go too deep into this because it's to me very annoying, but people will look at somebody and immediately assume something about that food. Um, I've heard things like, oh, well, this must be healthy for me. Or, oh my God, I like this must not have any flavor. Like, I don't think this will be very flavorful. Or, oh, this is gonna be the best barbecue or the best fried food ever, or whatever it might be. And like, they haven't even had a taste of the food yet, so they're just making an assumption. And it's not fair, and it's, we should stop doing that. If you're someone who does that, maybe try to stop doing that. Thanks. And talking about bodies, uh, being in the kitchen is really hard on your body. There is a lot of repetitive motion. And so certain muscles and muscle groups are going to be worked more than others. And that has an impact, impact on like, you know, the balance of your body. It's also usually very long hours. You're on your feet the whole time, walking around, or sometimes even standing in one place. Um, you know, picking up heavy ingredients, moving large cambros of, of stuff around. So you get a workout while you're at work, but you might not necessarily be paying attention to your form 
you're paying attention a lot more to the food. This can cause extra stress on, of course, your feet from being on them all day, your knees, ankles, hips, your back. So always try to use the best form as possible, of course, whenever you're lifting heavy things. Um, but And if you're doing a lot of repetitive motion, see if there's a different or more efficient way to do it, potentially. And if there's not, be sure to take time every once in a while and kind of like stretch out some of those muscles. I think one of the best things that you can do, and I must admit, I don't, I've never been as good at this as I would like to, but if you're not in the culinary field yet, start now anyway. Get a good full body daily stretching routine down and make it a habit and uh, do that every day, every single day, even if you're exhausted, still do it because your body takes on a lot throughout the day, especially working in a kitchen and being able to dedicate a little bit, okay, being able to dedicate a part of your day to stretching is going to be very helpful in your body holding up long enough to work in the culinary field for as long as you want to. Number six is you have to be in a really specific role in order to be creative with food in the way most people think of wanting to be creative with food. Meaning that anybody might be able to be creative in finding a more efficient way to dice vegetables and whatnot. But if you want to be writing new menu items, so if you want to be the one who is writing new menu items, creating new menu items, if you want to be pairing different flavors together for a new dish or experimenting with textures and different, the cat wants to jump up. different cooking techniques. You have to be like at the top of the top. So you could be an executive chef at a restaurant, um, but it's gonna take a good amount of time to get there. Uh, most of your career is not gonna be spent in that position. Unless you like open and own your own restaurant. Well, this is another thing about working in the restaurant industry is you don't get to spend as much time at home with your cats who like to interrupt your YouTube videos. Now, if you want to open your own restaurant, be the restaurant owner, then yeah, you can choose to have that creative side. But you, as in being the owner, you're gonna have a lot of other stuff to do too. So even in that situation, it can be difficult to find the time to be super creative with new dishes. Also, you, you're gonna have a lot more on the line whenever you own the place. So, you know, get working your way up to a certain point in your career where you get to make those creative decisions is, of course, a great goal to have. Unfortunately, a lot of times once you're up to that spot, you have a lot of, you have a lot of things to do. You can't just focus on only doing that. So while it's a portion of your job, it's not going to be all of your job. And of course, it depends on how often menu the menu is rotated. So maybe every month you are creating new menu dishes for the following month. Maybe it's quarterly, maybe it's annually, but there's probably going to be a week or two or even down to like a day or two a focus on making those new dishes and it's not going to be like the bulk of your job, unfortunately. The only other place is the test kitchen where I would say that there can be opportunities for more creativity and getting to play around with things. Um, I spent six years in a test kitchen environment and it was great in that aspect, um, but there's it's not just the fun part of being creative. Um, there, there's a lot more that goes into it than just, just that, and I won't get into all of it. There's definitely a lot of science and cost controls, and um, it's not just creating new things, but it's also kind of testing the limits of what you have created to make sure that things are replicatable thousands and thousands of times. So it's so great to want to be very creative with food, and there will be opportunities to do that, but it's not going to be 100% of your job in the culinary field. 
if you're if you like follow a pretty traditional type path. Okay, so if you are thinking about going to culinary school, I want to share with you some of the things that I would have wanted to know before before making that commitment. And I, I loved my college experience. I, I enjoyed culinary school and I, I would probably do it all over again. But there are some things that I think it would be really helpful to know and consider ahead of time if this is something that you are thinking of doing. So number one, uh, culinary school is not cheap at all. <laughs> it's pretty expensive and unfortunately the average salaries in the food service industry are not very impressive. So just understand the financial balance. Um, it is definitely skewed towards school's going to be real expensive and your salaries. It's You'll have some challenges earning a salary that you feel appropriately represents the money that you spent on your degree. School is going to give you an exposure to several different cooking styles and ingredients and like processes, cost control, things like that. But you won't really learn it until you are in the industry working in a kitchen. That's where you're going to build the comfort and the efficiency. So you'll, you'll get an idea of stuff, but you really, um, there's just a lot of repetition in order to get you to feel like an expert in, in areas. And the time it takes to get that comfort can only come from working because there's just not enough time in the classroom. And then if you are going to school for culinary, I would recommend pairing some sort of like business or hospitality degree along with that. Um, it will make you more marketable and the classes that you'll be taking, you'll get a more well-rounded view of the industry because the food part is very important. Um, but as you move along, your the longevity of your career, you might want to do things that are not solely food focused. Remember how I talked about how it's hard on your body? You may, might get to an age where you're, you say like, okay, I can't spend 12 hours in the kitchen six days a week anymore. And then also know that there is a difference between a bachelor's degree or a program where you get a degree versus a certification program. And I think that they both have their merits and I think whichever one you choose to do, um, just make sure that it's the right fit for you. But a certificate program is going to take significantly less time, should be of course less expensive. However, it could potentially be a little bit more difficult as you go further in your career, potentially. Whereas, of course, like I had said, you know, pairing your culinary degree with a business degree a lot more comparable to like your average four-year university type experience. So in my opinion, overall, uh, getting into the industry, working in the industry is more important than going to culinary school. You will learn more in, in a kitchen and in building strong relationships with the chef that you're working under. Um, also, when you do choose to move to different jobs, um, trying to expand into different types of cooking styles so you're not so that so that you have an opportunity to learn from a different chef and about a different style of food is really helpful and important. I think that if you want to go to culinary school that is awesome but I recommend that you work in the industry for some time before that way like these six things I'm saying I wish I knew, you really get a fam familiarity and you really understand those six things along with everything else that you're going to experience before you decide to make the investment in a degree. Um, your experiences are gonna be different than my experiences, not only because of time and because we come from different backgrounds and, and all of that, um, but just because no two people's experiences are ever the same. So I absolutely urge you to get into the industry and get an understanding of it and if you think it's right for you before spending the money on school. And I don't want this video to make it seem like I hated any of my working experience in professional kitchens or anything like that. There is such a fun energy 
on good days in a kitchen and I wouldn't have figured out what I want to do unless I got in there and saw the different things that are possible to do. So I would have never thought of starting a grocery delivery and virtual personal chef service if I didn't already work in the industry. I wouldn't have realized the need that people at home have for wanting to learn more about how to cook and how to cook in a very personalized way. I also wouldn't have realized how I, how much I enjoy helping people bring more confidence and convenience into their kitchens at home. So with that, I want to share a few of the things that, I guess a few of the most important things that I have been able to take from a professional kitchen into my own at-home kitchen and what I like to help my clients learn. So these are my top five professional chef skills that I use all the time at home. These aren't really in any particular order. So knife skills. Knife skills are very important in that you want to feel comfortable and confident holding a sharp object like this, like a knife. Um, so of course there are the very technical, you know, a large dice is three quarter inch by three quarter inch versus a julienne versus all of that. And, a, and it's good to be comfortable with those terms so that when you read it, you know, you, you understand what the recipe writer was look, going for. But more than that, it's important to understand how knife cuts are going to cook down. That way you can personalize your meals to ensure that the texture of whatever you're going for is going to be in the finished dish. Also, if you understand the amount of time you have to cook, then like if you're, for example, if you're short on time, then I'm going to be cutting my vegetables a lot smaller so that they are going to cook quicker. So being confident with a knife and then being confident in the knife cuts that you choose for your, all of your ingredients, that's the important part. Another one is to mise en place and the importance of prepping. And this really implements the timing of your dish. So ensuring that everything comes together at the time that you want to eat and you don't have 75% of stuff ready and you're waiting on the one thing and now everything else is getting cold while you're waiting on something to finish cooking and you feel stressed in the process because you weren't really prepped well and maybe you have some onions being sauteed on the stove while you are trying to get, trying to get other vegetables ready to add to that pan and it took you longer than you anticipated and so now the onions are burnt in your pan. There's a lot of different ways that not being prepared can come back to bite you. So the, it's very important to mise en place which means having everything in its place and front loading as much of the work as possible. That way, once you have the heat going, you're working in a rhythm and in a flow and then things will come together really well. And you don't have to pause once the heat's already on. You don't have to pause and say like, oh my God, I have to rush to get something done so that nothing burns. Another one is knowing your palate. So really understanding your food preferences and this can sound a little bit like, well, of course, I know what I like to eat and I don't like to eat, but it's really getting specific on exactly why you do enjoy flavors, you enjoy certain flavors together, why you don't like certain flavors, and also textures. All of that applies to texture also. And it's important because, of course, if you're going to go out and eat and as you're reading through a menu, you want to feel confident that whatever you're going to order, you're really going to enjoy. And then also at home, when you're cooking for yourself, you wanna be able to make those little decisions as you're cooking to know that you're making this dish as delicious as it can be for you. So it's not just like, oh, I love pizza. It's, okay, I love the combination of bread and like the melty cheese but with the marinara sauce in there and I like when the marinara sauce is just a little bit acidic and not too sweet and I like the saltiness of the pepperoni along with maybe the savory element of the mushroom that's why I like pepperoni and mushroom on my pizza whatever it may be but understanding all of those elements that you like 
because then you can replicate that in you know something that's not a pizza and you feel confident that you're going to enjoy that food and then whenever you do taste food you might that's like meh you might be able to say like oh well if i just added an acidic ingredient to this like maybe some red wine vinegar or something i'm gonna like this a lot more and so in the moment you can adjust that dish to be something that you love even more all right and then a level of comfort with your kitchen tools so sometimes when we look at kitchen tools we can feel a little bit overwhelmed or intimidated by how do you use them and so a great thing about being in a professional kitchen is a lot of times you have someone training you but you also have the hours of working with that tool over and over again and you get really comfortable and you can even look for some creative ways to use some tools so maybe it has one specific use but you know like oh i can also use that to help me be more efficient in these other ways and then of course just an overall more broad understanding of cooking styles and how to use flavor so salt isn't the only seasoning that's important <laughs> and i think that the more food that you eat and the more that you challenge your palate, the more you'll, uh, the more ideas you will have for creating really interesting, great flavors in your own food. So um, from a flavor standpoint, the more adventurous you can be, the better. And same with cooking styles. So the more adventurous that you can be in tasting styles, and like I was saying, like going and working at different places that have different styles, you'll find so many different ways to cook an onion or to cook rice or to make a soup. Like there's endless ways. So being able to absorb as much of that as you can and then bringing in the best elements in your eyes to your own kitchen is so, so helpful. Thanks Chefeteers for taking a little bit of a trip down memory lane with me. If you are like considering getting into the culinary field and you have any additional questions, feel free to add it in the comments. Um, like and subscribe if you liked this video and if you want some help bringing more confidence and convenience into your kitchen if you're in the Denver area I do grocery delivery and cooking classes um, or if you live anywhere else <laughs> which probably most of you do I do have online virtual uh, personal chef services that I'll link below and you can go and find out all about that thank you chef of tears I put out new videos every other Wednesday so I will see you in two Wednesdays